fat grafting, and this is going to be good for, I think, beginners all the way to advanced. And I think the technique is going to be more for beginners, but the philosophy and aesthetics will be good for all uh, comers. Um, no disclosures for anything I talk about. All my uh, uh, book charity books uh, go to stop human trafficking. The, the profits go there. I'm just really passionate about that cause. We've been talking about that. Um, as you heard from Tim, it's not a monolithic thing. It's not just gravity, it's not just volume, but they're all elements to aging. Fat grafting is only one part of that spectrum. The biggest thing I want you to remember today, besides aesthetics, is really that fat is a bioactive uh, product. And if you live in the Bible Belt, you also live in the fat belt. And in Texas region, there's a lot of variability in people's weight gain and weight loss. And I believe that this is not something that is static, like a, like a hyaluronic acid filler. It is actually something that can gain or lose weight. So like for, when I, I do a lot of hair restoration, and so when I look at hair, I look at how old the patient is, what's the pattern of loss, what's the history. Same thing with fat, I look at how much weight have they gained and lost over their lifetime? Is it, is it stable? Have they had children? Um, where, are, where are their parents in terms of their uh, obesity statuses? All of these things are so important. I don't want to take someone that just said, hey, I just lost 100 pounds uh, last week and I'm ready to do the fat because they can really get quite bigger afterwards because fat is bioactive and that is probably the key take home message if you don't know that already. Fat is also permanent. I've heard some lecturers talk about fat just being a, a scar tissue that's being built and it's, it's not real. This is a, I do a lot of lip corrections for overdone silicone, fat lips, etc. And this is a lady that, that didn't tell me she had a fat graft in her lips. And I opened up the lip and I said, you had a fat graft? She goes, no, I had some in my face, not in my lip. I said, no, you, I'm looking at fat. So that's 10 years later. The fat is permanent. It is, it is something that you need to think long term in terms of your consequences. People that don't do fat, they're very scared of the lower eyelid. And in lab, I think that this is the best lab in terms of simulating what fat, how it feels. I mean, it's the absolute closest you're gonna feel. And I always encourage you, if you're uncomfortable with this, do uh, use a hyaluronic acid-based filler, but do it as if you're doing fat, because the injection method is exactly the opposite. Um, this is a perpendicular injection that's deeper, whereas with fillers, you, I, I go use a cannula and go parallel. So I encourage you to use a reversible hyaluronic acid-based filler as a test, and I encourage you, if you are not comfortable doing lower eyelids, which is technically not that difficult if you get, get the basics down, to uh, help, help, let me help you in lab. That's going to be very helpful. Um, dynamic issues. I'm really focused now, and the lecture will be talking about the external part of the face rather than the central part of the face. And I'm, I'm talking about halos and, and circles, and so I'm moving away from just the central anterior cheek because I find that my patients, they have a higher retention of, of that fat in that area, and it can look off when they're smiling. So I'm much more conservative in terms of anterior cheek positioning, uh, uh, placing of fat. This slide just means I don't use uh, marketing terms like stem cell facelift or stem cell things. I think there's definitely some contributory elements over the long haul where I see a year, two, three years later something magnificent with the skin. I don't do nano fat. I don't know to what extent that's replica repl replicable uh, and to what extent that you can tell a patient that you're going to get it. Where there's so many even much far easier ways to, to get better skin results. But there is something with the skin look that has a lot to do with shadows that I'll be addressing in this lecture. I'm sort of a single session person. I believe that the problem with fat, you heard my biggest fear is an overfill. because you, It's hard to re, uh, address that. At the end of the lecture, I'm going to talk to you about how to address that the best you can. But I don't like filling, 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 filling. I believe that the margin, if it needs a touch up, I'm going to go in there and just put a little bit of filler to, to micro finesse things. I think fat uh, can grow, it can change, and you want to use it more like a mattress, a foundation work. So I don't believe fat is good for acne scars, for surface flaws, for small little areas, for asymmetry. I was giving a lecture in 2007 in Columbia, and uh, I talked about not using it for reconstructive purposes by building a whole face, especially a young patient. An older, ma mature patient with stable weight, yes. And the, the next lecture said, I wish I heard your talk because I just did a mandible and two years later it grew because the lady was young and there was metabolic activity and weight gain. So just keep in mind some of the more conservative elements of fat. Fat is an incredibly great tool if you understand the pros, cons, limitations. 
and you can communicate that with the patient. I like the saying, like replaces like. What that means is if there is hard tissue loss, which we'll talk about briefly in this talk and how I use it, uh, you replace it with hard tissue. So this concept is that as we get older, there's this loss and this, this margin uh, erodes. And so if you put an implant in, I believe that it looks, it can be more exposed. Now that's, for me, I'm really talking about malar implants. I really believe that. <clears throat> for me, adding volume on the lateral face with, with fat is much more effective in terms of blending and contouring than it is a heart implant, but I'm a big fan of chin implants. I believe that if you've got a very recessed bone, you're not gonna be able to get that same effect with just adding fat into the chin. You can get close, but you're not even gonna quite simulate that degree of predictable projection. So fat, on the other hand, uh, it it's covers the exposed bone. I think this is a better way to go in terms of thinking of soft tissue like places like soft tissue for soft tissue, hard tissue for hard tissue. You heard uh, my talk about the idea that we look at a face and we get a concept of, of the beauty uh, uh, and use of this face. And that has a lot to do with facial shape. And the oval is oftentimes more of an ideal, although a lot of women like that sculpted look at 35 where it's starting to, to narrow inwards. And so that ovalization is what I sort of target and encourage uh, female patients to consider. It's sort of the best of both worlds. It's interesting that if you talk to men, they think that um, that the women look better at 20 when the face is rounder. You talk to women, they think their face looks better at 30, 35 when it's a little bit more sculpted. So a schematic of how to address that is uh, for the upper temple, if you look at the zygomatic arch, that temple concavity is best addressed with volume in my opinion. Um, there's going to be many ways to skin a cat. You're going to uh, hear this, but for me, I think volume is the best way. When we're looking at lateral, it's, uh, if you're, if you're going to do a lift, that can oftentimes compensate enough of the very lateral um, to give you some volume, but I oftentimes add fat there as well. If you're looking down here, remember that squared apex at 40 to 60 that you want to soften and bring that in. Uh, the way I do that, you know, if they're grinding a lot, they have the high masseter, that's going to be a Botox. If it is something in terms of sagging and, and a lateral excess is going to be a lift and bringing that back in, but oftentimes I combine that with the lift because they've already had, they have sagging, but they also have a loss of volume across it out here, so they may need a little bit of volumization at the same time as lifting. And then for the central area, the lower portion, I, I consider if they have a, a weaker chin and a, and a shorter neck, the, the chin implant usually does very, very well. And fat, I do uh, what I call the upside down U, which is the area above the chin where there's a little bit um, of volume loss in that area. The one thing is you're going to hear and see a lot of three-quarter lateral view, uh, results that are excellent at this talk. I believe that a huge component of how we address each other socially is our frontal view. So a lot of what I'm going to focus on is how that shape is affected when we look at a person from the frontal view. So ovalization through fat graft, you can see it just takes a square face and, and brings it a little bit more balance. She's had some neuromodulators as well. Um, and also it doesn't affect the smile, which is important. And some people uh, want a little bit more roundness of the face, a little bit more youthfulness. The next component I'm going to talk about is what I call asymmetric triangles, a concept I thought about um, over the last few years. And in the past, um, I was very focused on the concept of the lateral brow being really pretty, and it is. But if you just focus on the lateral brow and not the inner brow, it can actually weigh down the outer brow and make it look heavier because that lateral descent. So I'm actually now putting about two-thirds of the fat medially into the inner brow to offset this. So if you think about how that lateral brow sits, if I can lower more of the inner brow where there's that what they call A-frame deformity or volume loss, it can shape the brow to be more horizontal in nature. So that's just a concept, an aesthetic concept. And I think if you start looking for this, you can see this. And so I'm gonna, going to go over this in a little bit more detail, but essentially I'm doing a parallel injection securely. I'm doing a perpendicular injection for fat inferiorly. And so this is just a younger lady. You can see that just reshaping that inner brow uh, makes it look less sagging, even though I've really not done the eyelid surgery. And the even Asian eyelids, as they mature, you start to see multiple folds. If you just add some volume back, it can actually return some of the folds. And so taking a history for that Asian patient, how that fold look in their 20s can be a good source before you do an Asian blepharoplasty or whatever you think about. Again, uh, some neuromodulators, but I've done more in the inner brow than the outer brow to reshape and make that look less sagging. So how does light affect the face? I think a large component of what you're looking at in terms of skin improvement is how light bounces off the face. So 
When I take my photographs, I take them without a flash with very um, even top balance light because to me, the way that light strikes the skin is all top down. If you think about it, if we're indoors or outdoors, we're all top down lighting. So I want to simulate that, but of course, if it's too stark, it's going to look over exaggerated. You don't want that. So you have a, a, a room that has a very controlled lighting situation without ambient light from uh, windows, et cetera, I think is very important to have a controlled environment. So a deflated face has less light reflex than a face that has more volume. So there's a better light reflex uh, for these faces. Longevity, I because as I said, I do a lot of hair restoration, I think about how grafts take over time. The hair transplant model is that there is really a longer process of neovascularization than a lot of us may uh, think about. What essentially that means is wait before you go and think about a touch-up. Whether that's with fat or with whatever mo modality you think, I would give it some more time. So I believe that there's a point where there's a very swollen look, and then it looks almost flawless because it stretches all the wrinkles out. I tell patients that's that honeymoon degree of swelling. There's a dip, and there's sometimes a little bit of change over a period of six months to a year. So if you just sort of follow it over a period of time, you can sort of see some evolution, and this is the only thing else I did during this time with some neuromodulators, uh, and you can see that there's just a gentle shaping and without weight gain. Donor dominance is the concept in hair restoration, which is the idea that um, the, what, what the hairs behave like in its source, for are genetically programmed for, will behave here. To me, that's very similar to when you look at that estrogen-rich fat cells from the, from the donor site, it actually behaves that way in the face. So when you're thinking about transplanting it, think about how it behaves there. So weight gain, weight loss. Um, uh, and so I think it's more resistant toward loss, but it also is more prone toward weight gain. Um, and those concepts of donor dominance should be thought about as well. How I do it, so we're just gonna run through some basics. I don't think you need to go too deep into this. Uh, again, my book uh, has a really a cookbook recipe of how to harvest. I harvest from uh, inner, outer, middle thigh, and uh, abdomen. I think those are the choice areas. This is just my setup on there, breaking it down, harvesting the fat. I then take, uh, take off the uh, cannula, the harvesting cannula, place on the bottom cap, take off the top, place on the top cap, sterile centrifuge and centrifuge sleeves in, uh, for about 3,000 RPMs, three minutes, and a balanced centrifuge. Take it out, pour off the supernatant, and then uh, pour off the infranatant, transfer gently into a 20cc uh, transfer hub, making sure you don't squirt this across the room. And then using a female to female transfer hub, putting into 1cc lure lock syringes. And I prefer the 1.2 millimeter cannula. I, I know a lot of people prefer the 0 0.9. I use Tulip brand. I do not make any money off uh, these comments on any, anything I'm talking about today. Uh, just having a photo in the room is helpful. I, I do all my mental uh, design before they go in because they're sitting up, but then I have some minor adjustments by just reviewing the photographs and looking at them on the table. But most of the things I do not look at design-wise while they're lying down. So this is a 0 0.9. You can already see it's bent. I'm a little bit uh, less gentle with the 0 0.9, but I prefer the 1.2. And fat is really a conceptual thing where you're, you're feeling the height. You're feeling, is it, at, at what plane are you injecting it? Um, and so, for example, when I'm working on the lower eyelid, I'm much deeper. I'm releasing the uh, arcus marginalis in that area to, to make sure that I don't get a, a, a lump on one side or the other of it. And so I inject the medial uh, half about, for me, one and a half to two milliliters of, uh, of, of product. And then for the lateral um, rim, I divide that about one and a half on average, sometimes less, one, sometimes a little bit more to 1.82. Then always I access the lateral campus as a separate um, site and entry because I find that there's a little lateral dip if I don't access that as an independent uh, entry site. So just a short video uh, of this. I use my non-dominant finger not only to protect the globe but also to feel that I'm getting a release. And if you don't know what that, that release is, um, please come and let me work with you in the lab. It is not that hard, but it takes a few minutes, a few, an hour or so just to, to train you to feel that little bit of a release. The lateral brow, as I said, just to reiterate a point, I'm more focused on the medial brow today than I am on the lateral brow. I put most of my product medially. It doesn't happen to every single patient, but when I see that lateral descent, I think it really helps contribute toward a more even result. 
Um, I don't do a lot of the anterior cheek today because of, of the fact that it can be a dynamic issue. I'm focused more laterally. This is a lateral fill from that. I focus uh, farther out. I'm also doing less in the buckle zone. I think the buckle is an expansion of the, of the central face where it can also have some contributory element when, it's, when the person is smiling. Um, <clears throat> I also fill the pre-jowl. If I'm not doing a, a chin augmentation, if I am, I, 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 I do not do that. Um, I still believe that uh, uh, you can still fill a little bit to the uh, anterior chin above the pre-jowl. If you're going to fill the pre-jowl and you're not doing a lift, you should fill a little bit below the actual uh, inferior border of the mandible to capture a little bit of the jowl. I do a lot of li micro liposuction of the jowl at the same time I do lifts and fat wraps as well. I think the physical reduction of the jowl can be very helpful during any procedure. And this is just showing some more anterior uh, injections. I inject the uh, lateral mandible deep. That's because of Tim, and he's really taught me a lot about how to do this uh, in combination with lifting as well as, uh, as a standalone procedure. That way it doesn't interfere with the lifting. And this is in multiple directions. And then I don't do any bandages for the patients afterwards. This is just immediately post. Last part of my talk is going to be how do you correct fat grafting uh, issues or errors. So uh, this is a sort of a schematic that I think can be helpful for you. So if you have an upper blepharoplasty excess or brow excess, the way I access that is going to be through an upper blepharoplasty incision. For tear trough excesses, and I want to make a distinction, I made this distinction in my book, which is if the fat is very fibrotic and thick, um, I see less of that today. It's usually due to technical error in the way that it was injected. It's usually scar tissue, 5 fluorouracil um, with uh, triamcinolose, 9, 10 milligram per milliliter is a good way to inject it. What is the, the way I mix it? I basically use the 5 fluorouracil, which is for intravenous use, but I use it uh, intralesionally. I mix about, depending on the, the, the lesion, 0.3 of 5 fluorouracil and 0.1 of triamcinolone, so a 3 to, three to 1 ratio, and if I just double that for bigger areas and then quadruple that for even bigger areas. But that's my usual ratio to minimize uh, dermal atrophy in the surrounding areas. So if it's a fibrotic um, issue, then I will go in there and inject it first with triamcinolone, acetonide with 5-fluorouracil or 5-FU. If it is something that's just soft, palatable as fat, I don't think that's going to work. I have to excise it. In the mid-cheek temple region, I am doing more work with just suctioning out the area. Again, if it feels firm, I use 5-fluorouracil uh, with K10. If but one thing I've learned is that even just the act of microliposuction can engender a little bit of fibrosis in the tissues, and I follow up the microliposuction um, simultaneously at the same time with a little bit of this mixture, about uh, a 6-2 mix of 5-FU to K10 uh, per cheek with a 27-gauge needle. I inject that right after the microliposuction, and I do that again a month two months later, sometimes it takes three rounds after the microliposuction to just not allow the scar tissue to build from just the act of the microliposuction. Um, for uh, lip reductions, I do a ton of these. Uh, when I do silicone reductions, I'm actually taking a wider swath of, of mucosa. I believe that you have to take, a lot of people try to take it from inside the mouth and drag the lip in. I don't think that works. You have to take the dry and wet lip interface, take the proportionate dry lip uh, um, problem, proportional degree of wet lip problem, excise that. I'm a little more, when I know there's fat, I'm more conservative with the mucosa. I take a little bit less down and I am actually cauterizing down the fat rather than trying to excise all of it and that just reduces really well, which you'll see in a minute, which uh, I'll go into the mechanics more in detail right now. So for example, this is an upper uh, blepharoplasty incision accessing the fat. I use a cautery just to uh, get down to where the fat is. I do a little bit of blunt dissection until the fat is discovered. Fat is very obvious, it looks like fat. And then I just cauterize down the excess fat to reduce the bulk of it. To me, that's a safer, less traumatic way of reduction. Just showing lower lid, uh, tear trough incisions. This is just some microliposuction. I use the standard 1.2 millimeter. I use a Johnny Lock, which is what is uh, part of the Tulip company's uh, ability to keep that, uh, the plunger pulled back at, and held to, uh, at a negative five, six, seven cc's of, of uh, pressure so that I don't have to keep my hand holding that back. And this is just a, a very short video. I don't think this really has much merit, but it's sometimes nice just to see uh, what I'm talking about, just, just going across there and, and liposuctioning it. And uh, this is just showing you, I squirt the fat onto a gauze, and I, it's, a, it's not a perfect way to measure things, but I, I get a sense of 
how much fat I'm taking out from each side. So a summary of, uh, of this uh, is that fat is bioactive. I think this is the most important thing. You know, prima non nocere is probably more important than getting a great fat result is also avoid a bad one. Uh, so weight history, looking at the weight of the age of the patient in general, I like to work on patients if I can above 35, preferably 40, even more. Look at their weight history. If their weight history is relatively stable, uh, they've had children. I know I'm repeating myself, but this is the key things that I think are important. I'm very cautious when I'm looking at this as doing asymmetric work for reconstructive purposes. Uh, simply, be, And if you do do that, I don't think it's wrong to do that. I think it's important to take that history, make sure that the patients understand that they, if they gain weight or things change their, or metabolism alters as they get into um, uh, uh, menopause, et cetera, that there can be some changes to that, to that fat. Look at the first course is if they gain weight is for them to lose weight. If they can lose weight, they can reduce that, that fat bulk. Fat is variable. I, I, what I always tell my patients is I'm using fat as a contour mechanism to help provide a general softness to the face where shadows are better, bone is covered, but it may not provide exact one-to-one -one reproducible outcomes. And I believe, as I mentioned, that I don't find fat reliable to constantly re-inject a patient. I think you can e easily overfill them if you're trying to achieve perfection. Uh, for my margin, I always use a little uh, filler if I need to to make minor adjustments, and I counsel my patients preoperatively, they may need a, a small touch-up uh, down the line uh, in office rather than doing uh, a lot of fat uh, injections. So fat is soft, it is not great for surface flaws, I do not believe it's great in my hands or in my opinion for acne scars, for, small, for little creases or folds or lines, um, I, I think there's so many office-based therapies that are there that can be helpful. I think the, the problem with most injectors out there is that they don't think they think everything can be solved injection-wise, and not and they don't need surgery, which, as you know, as surgeons, that that is not true. But I think the opposite bias is there as well. Surgeons believe everything must be surgically operated on to create durable results. I think that is also false. I think there is a marriage between office and surgical therapies, and if you can understand the pros and cons limitations of all the technologies that are bound that we have today, we can do safer and more effective work. I do not have experience working on scar tissues with nano fat. I think it's an, an incredibly interesting subject. Today, I believe there are a lot less invasive methods to achieve the same methods. Um, if you've heard my talk in, uh, in Vegas about uh, using uh, mesobotulinum toxin, I believe you can get incredibly good skin therapies without having to go through a surgical outcome. Again, this is that concept of marrying surgical and non-surgical so that your brain can sort of envelop a wider gamut of uh, opportunities and, and methodologies to help a patient. Complication management, quick summary is if they're too full, lose weight. That's my first go-to, work with them on that. Um, and uh, before you start doing this, if they, they can't do it, then we start, then I start having to, re uh, having to reduce it. If things are fibrotic in nature, my first go-to is injecting it to reduce it, not trying to excise it. <clears throat> if there's discrete lumps, my first go-to is a soft, discrete lumps, it's excision. Uh, if things are too full and they're soft, my first go-to is microlipo, uh, followed by a serial injections of 5-fluorouracil in, in K10. Uh, no financial incentives for any of these talks, as I said. I encourage you, if you can, come July 24th to 25th, uh, St. Louis again, for uh, my annual hair course. I really thank Mike for getting me involved with this whole, the whole process. Um, the, I'm very passionate about the American Board of Hair Restoration Surgery. If you guys are interested in knowing more about it, please come and talk to me. Um, I am, I'll be incoming president in two, uh, 2021, so I'm, I'm very, very, uh, very, very uh, uh, passionate about, about the leadership role in this organization. If you're interested, please let me know. And I finally leave you with this concept is that uh, I think it's incredibly important to be great technicians, but you also have to open your mind and see what's beautiful. A lot of times we just say, hey, that looks better to us, but does a person socially uh, look better in, in that role? So thank you.